Um, Halb is very excited to have Amanda Bradford with us today, the founder and CEO of The League, um, an exclusive dating app aimed at intelligent, ambitious people seeking out similarly ambitious professionals. Um, often coined the Tinder for Elite, it was launched in 2015 with $2.1 million in seed round funding. The League has since rapidly expanded into new markets and it's now live in over 20 cities and it boasts a wait list of over 100,000 people. Um, Amanda earned a computer science degree from Carnegie Mellon and an MBA from Stanford Business School. She previously worked at Salesforce, Google, and Sequoia Capital before launching the league. And on a side note, Amanda told me that Harvard Law is one of the league's <laughs> top referral communities. So good job, everyone. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Amanda, we are really excited to have you here. So to get started, could you just describe your initial inspirations and motivations for founding the league? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks everyone for having us, <laughs> me, um, and just to get the logistics out of the way, because I know every time I do one of these talks, I watch people download the app in front of me. So if you want the complimentary expedited review, just um, hashtag your concierge HLS if you're not yet on the league, and we will give you complimentary expedited review as a thank you for having me and giving you guys free food. So I appreciate that. It's always better to have a crowd that is not hungry. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. So, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about, I guess, how I got started and my inspiration. Uh, I guess my inspiration was sitting in a classroom, not unlike this one, um, three years ago at this point. I guess three and a half years ago. So I graduated uh, Stanford Business School in 2014. I was in my second semester of my second year. And as you know, I don't know how much you guys know about MBAs, but we don't do much that that semester. Um, so I decided to like apply for a bunch of these entrepreneurship project classes at Stanford, which are like, very, very selective. You know, talk about <laughs> talk about hard to get into. I think I got rejected from like almost every entrepreneurship project class because I didn't have a co-founder. Um, so I ended up pulling one of my teachers aside and was like, will you just hold me accountable so I don't, you know, be lazy and like kind of put me through the same program that you would in these classes, but, um, but I'm going to just do it by myself. So that's sort of what got me started. So I kind of spent the last semester writing a business plan. I did like, I spent a lot of waste of time actually uh, applying to a bunch of kind of accelerator programs, uh, making those YouTube videos that are like your two minute pitch of like what, you know, how I'm gonna disrupt dating. Um, I specced out a lot of screens, kind of did all the, did all the heavy lifting so that when, come June when I graduated, um, I was able to find a developer that I ended up paying um, in cash and stock and he ended up building the product that I had kind of spent, you know, most of that semester specking. Um, and we launched that in November. So we basically, he built it in about four months. So it was a very, uh, I would call it an MVP would be, uh, be nice. <laughs> uh, as far as like minimum viable product, it barely, it barely worked. Um, and we ended up launching, we learned that it wasn't really working when we launched New York on it. And all of a sudden, you know, we had all these users and people were waiting like over a, a minute to kind of get their matches every day. Um, and you know people are very desperate for dating apps when they're waiting a minute and still coming back, which was pretty crazy. Um, so I like to say that's how we know there was product market fit when they'll wait <laughs> a minute to get, to get your matches. But that was sort of kind of the, the genesis of, of, I guess, sort of how I built it. As far as like what inspired me, um, it was being single, really. Uh, I had become... Um, I had become single in graduate school, which unfortunately happens, uh, you know, despite, despite noble attempts uh, to stay in the relationship. So it was a long relationship. So I had actually had never done online dating because it was five years. So five years ago, like no one was doing online dating. Tinder wasn't around. Um, and before, I remember even before I had become single and we were, I was still in a relationship, I had noticed that a bunch of my friends were now on Tinder. And, uh, you know, these are like very eligible like people that have never done online dating. And I was like, this is weird. Why, what are you guys on? And I remembered I did an internship my second, uh, or I guess my only summer of business school at Sequoia Capital, which is a really good venture capital firm out in Bay Area. And I remember that we didn't get much time with the managing partners, but he, they did pull me aside one time and kind of told me how Sequoia had made their name and how 
what they learned was, you know, when you see a huge shift in, in technology, uh, but, but more so a huge shift in consumer behavior, you know, whether it's buying behavior or sort of, you know, how your kind of social behavior when like the whole fabric of that is changing, that's called like a wave and you start, you know, get, get on that wave, start swimming. And that was sort of how they, you know, what happened with them in semiconductors. And so that was sort of, I guess, top of mind when I remember thinking like, oh, my friends are now on a dating app, what? When did this happen overnight? And I was like, I think this is a wave. So I was like, I gotta start swimming um, in the sense that, you know, I didn't, I, I could kind of predict that there would be tender fatigue. I personally didn't like the product for, litany of reasons, which I'm happy to go into, um, and I felt like there would be a good time, time-wise, it would be a good time in the market to kind of put a competitive product out. So that was sort of, I guess, what inspired me to, to take the jump. And I will be honest with you guys, just because you're similar to me in the sense of it's really scary to take the jump. I definitely hedged, and I actually had a job offer um, that I pushed out till December, and so I kind of worked on... I basically gave myself six months to, to ship the product. So I, in some ways, you could say that that was like me not believing in the vision, but I like to say I was like a smart, you know, graduate student that was kind of hedging my bets. And it was like, if no one downloaded the app and it wasn't successful, then I didn't kind of, you know, take that, take the wrong shot. So I kind of put myself on a, a super tight time frame. And I, and I actually think that was the right, the right call because it got us to ship earlier. And like Reed Hoffman always says, you should always be embarrassed by your, your first product, and we definitely were. <laughs> so, all right, so that long, my long rambly uh, genesis of sort of how, I guess, how I got started. So many people here are familiar with the league, and many are active users. Um, I know this for a fact. Woo! But, I know, H um, HLS for, is one of our, I told you, it's one of our top. But for some people, they've never heard of the league, or they're not <laughs> very familiar with it. So could you explain, like, how the app works and how it's structured um, a bit differently from Tinder, Coffee Me, sure. et cetera? Sure, so I'll, I'll run my new uh, marketing pillars, my three pillars on you guys, and you guys can tell me if it's a good, if it's a good pitch. Um, so th the main differences are control. So one is privacy. So I, one of my big issues wa was that I put, you know, I have, I have like all my business connections on LinkedIn. I'm pretty thorough about adding people that I'm doing business with on LinkedIn. I have my friends on Facebook. I'm pretty good about adding those. I felt like there was no reason why I needed to get presented like a coworker <laughs> that I'm like working on a project with as a potential match, a dating match. I thought that was just like a very awkward, uncomfortable situation. When I was working in VC, like um, practically the whole associate team were, <laughs> where we were all single um, and I like just didn't want them on that. So I was like, this is so easy to block if you just use LinkedIn and looked at place of work. Um, so that was like one big thing. I think the second piece was around community in the sense that I wanted there to be kind of an ethos. I think, you know, I was sort of inspired by Stanford, I guess, in the sense of you have this like very tight knit, you know, community of people that really value ambition and intelligence. And that's sort of like what everybody's striving to find in their partner. And so I kind of wanted a community that reminded me of that as I was leaving this sort of, you know, the leaving the farm, as they call it in Stanford. So I guess I was, you know, worried about kind of the real world. And so I was like, how do I kind of build that into the community? Um, and then I think context would be the third one is just I felt like no matter what, when I went to meet someone in person, I was doing my diligence. I was looking on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter to see what they tweet about or, you know, what did they decide to dedicate their career to and what are they passionate about? And I do think you can glean um, a lot of that information from LinkedIn. I don't think you can't tell, you know, the whole person's story, of course, but you get more of the story. And so I think I was just sick of having to take all those extra steps myself. So I was like, if we just kind of did all the work up front, then when people get into the community, it's a much better kind of authentic, easier, more fun experience for the, for the user. So that was sort of how I, how I thought about it when I was thinking of like what kind of what core things I felt like were missing in the competitors. Um, so could you describe your experience um, getting venture capital funding and specifically as a female entrepreneur in Silicon Valley? Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, like, I, it was, it's definitely kind of an eye roll <laughs> type of a, you know, you're fundraising for a dating app, you're a solo founder, um, you're a girl, blonde girl, like it's like a very stereotypical, uh, you know, situation almost, almost comical, I guess, in a way. But, um, you know, I, I found that I found that women responded almost instantly, like, you know, very successful women just got it. I didn't even need to really educate them. And 
explain to them the, the story of like how match is not really relevant for our generation. And you know, with the men, I was explaining that nobody's using match, and they're like, oh, I didn't know that. I, you know, I've been married 30 years, so <laughs> you're like, you're like, no, no one's used match. Um, you know, our generation, and so, and then you know, it was like, and what I've learned is that. Um, you want to, the more education you have to do, kind of the lower probability of a close. So as you think about it, it's just in pure sales. It's like if you have to educate someone on a market, you know, chances are that you're educating them and they're going to make a purchase. It's like, you know, there's much lower, lower probability. So I ended up just kind of focusing on, you know, I focus on women at the original, kind of at the initial founding, you know, a couple checks, I guess. And then once, once I had some good names up there, I was able to kind of get, get more of the men interested, but it, it definitely was, um, it definitely was an uphill battle kind of trying to explain to people sort of why, you know, why women don't want to be seen by their coworkers. Like all the guys were like, oh, I, I'd be fine. I'm fine dating at work, you know? We're like I date at work all the time. We're like, I know, that's why we're having so many issues right now. So let's just everyone not date at work, okay? And use the league, so. <laughs> That was sort of, I guess, one, one solution to, to some of the awkward kind of work environment situations. Um, so could you do, go through the selection process a bit? Like, is it based on algorithms? Is there some human review to the process? We copied Harvard Law admissions. That's <laughs> um, so why you guys all are getting in. Um, no, we did, we did kind of, kind of I think. You, you know, I like to say the about me is the essay, <laughs> and you know the interests are the extracurricular activities, and you know we we joke, but but I I think the concept holds in the, the sense that we want people that want to be in the community. You know, Harvard wouldn't accept someone that didn't fill out the application, even if they didn't have enough applicants, right? You would just have a smaller class size. So we we kind of think of it that way, as you know, if if there's people, if we're starting to get to a point where like people aren't filling out their photos, or you know, people don't have a profession or education, they're not they're either not listing it or they don't have one, um, but they're not kind of taking the time to sort of explain what they do have or, you know, I think we think of it as that way. So if the people want to be in, in the community, you can kind of tell and it's less about, you know, it's less about did they have a 4.0 GPA, right? It's, it's about did they, you know, what kind of quality of application did they put together? So I like to say it's not like, oh, you, got, you went to these schools. It's, it's sort of the whole package. And I like to think of it as like dating. When you see a profile, it's like you kind of know what, is a, what you think is a good profile that you want to swipe right on, right? It's not, it's not a rocket science that if, if your photos are all dark and you don't put anything in the, you know, in the sentences and you don't have any interest and you're, everything's very generic, that's not a high-quality profile. No one really, that doesn't like benefit anyone else in the community. So I kind of like to think of it as like I'm protecting uh, the community of people that cared enough to kind of put together a good profile. So I'm like the bouncer. And then on a related <laughs> note, um, has the technology evolved or improved over time, like as you've had more data to? Yeah, yeah, we've done, we've come a long way. Uh, we actually have an awesome engineering team finally. It took me a really long time to build. In, in Silicon Valley, it's hard to find, you know, good engineers that, that kind of are ready to take a jump away from the security of Google and Uber and Facebook. Um, so it definitely was a struggle and we had to, I had to kind of wait till we were in a later stage and had more traction to be able to, to kind of get really good engineers. But we're, but we're finally there and we're doing a lot with, um, actually I don't know if you guys noticed, we just, we're, we're doing a lot with photos and we're kind of experimenting a little bit with like, if we gloss up the photos, how does that change kind of acceptance rate? We, we turned all the photos black and white. Um, which we haven't yet announced, but you can tell in the app, I think, if you're on the, we kind of A-B tested it. So if you can see if you're on the black and white, but we noticed that that actually made acceptance rates go up, so it increased matches overall in the community by just turning everybody black and white, which I always said, everyone looks better in black and white, and now I have proof. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are little things we've done, but I think, you know, when I think long-term about kind of where we want to go is I, I think everybody's going to eventually have their own algorithm, right? That's where I, I want us to go. Right now it's, it's very much like, oh, you're this type of user, so you go into this algorithm, and you're this type of user, so you go into to this algorithm, and, you know, you're creating kind of segments, but I, I think we want to get to a point where everyone gets to kind of build their own, and you're, you know, if that's a deal breaker versus a nice to have, and you can kind of rank the, the preferences, because I think one thing we've seen is that preferences mean different things to different people, and, you know, depending on, you know, how kind of strict or not strict you are, the, the, right now we don't really have a way to kind of put a weight associated to, to how much you care about a particular attribute. Um, so that's, that's sort of some of the stuff we're thinking about. Uh, so since we're at Harvard Law School right now, could you discuss some of the legal challenges that you've faced as an app or just more generally that are common to dating apps in general? 
Yeah, it's actually, it's an interest. I think as a, as a law student, it's an interesting industry to consider going into because there's a lot of legal challenges. I've had another, another weird one we've had is um, people ripping off our domain, which I'm still learning about. You guys probably know more about it than me, but I guess someone bought theleagueapp.com and we're theleague.com. Um, and they're redirect, and they have like a fake, uh, a fake, you know, website that's like meet ambitious people, and it looks super cheesy. And you know, it, and it, then it, when you click on it, it goes to Millionaire Match, which is a different dating app. Um, so it's like, so, so we're we're in the middle of a scuffle with them right now, too, trying to get that taken down. Um, and then like another one, like we have someone on the le- someone on the App Store writes like the league elite singles dating, and so they'll kind of try to use our our brand in their app store marketing. So there's like a lot of little things like that and it's kind of a shady industry so people people do that a lot co- like very common <laughs> unfortunately. So lots of work for you guys. <laughs> so there's like 2500 apps on the Apple Store dating <laughs> apps and um, do you think Did you, that, you found that number it's a good yeah. <laughs> um, Sounds right. And do you think the market for dating apps is already saturated or do you think there's still room for successful players to enter in now? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think dating apps are going to go to, I, at least this is sort of my, what I'm doing with my company. I don't know. I, I like to think the, the industry is going this way too, but I think it's slowly becoming real software and it's software for your love life. But I, and I think we, we think of it as a platform, right? So if we can, if we can start to, you know, we, we have, we're starting to collect all this data. We have people that join at 22 average person's getting married at like, let's say 30 in most of our cities. So you almost have, you know, you have 10 years of kind of relationship with this person as your user. So it's like, how do we, how do we help them kind of take advantage of, of their own data that they're sort of giving us in their, you know, their decision making and how their tastes change over time. And, you know, maybe their dating preferences change over time. And so I think that's, that's sort of where I guess I want to take, take the industry and think of this as less of a, you know, who we have in our community, which of course we want to always have, you know, the, the best people in the community, but also we want to be the best product so that, you know, we get you still offline. Like the, the idea is we want to get you offline with a new person, you know, as fast as you, as fast as possible with kind of the most context as possible to have the best probability of a good first date, right? So that's sort of our, our mission. So we have to kind of think like what technology enhancements can we build, whether it's giving you a good first opener, or telling you what, you know, what someone's favorite coffee is so you can order it for them, you know, little stuff like that so that we can kind of be a utility. Because I think once you're a utility, um, you know, and you, people are kind of dependent on you for a part of their life, then, then I think that's where you, that's where the business is super successful in my mind. Um, so any interesting success stories like league marriages? We do, we do. We have some league babies. I'm trying to get a onesie designed. Um, I want to get. I wanted to get like some cool design, celebrity designer to design a, a league, a league baby uh, onesie. So if you know anyone, let me know. But uh, um, yeah, we have. We've had a lot. I think. I think it's as much as I want to say it's like because of the product. I, I think it's also because just due to the fact that our average user is like 27, 28, and that's sort of when people are really thinking about commitment and long-term relationships and, you know, finding their life partner. And so I think we happen to be kind of just well-positioned sort of right, you know, to the app kind of to use, you know, up until you, you get married, right? Especially right before. And so I think because of that, we have like a lot of, we have a lot of couples going into kind of marriages, but I don't want to be like the eHarmony brand. And we also have a lot of, you know, 22 and 24 year olds um, just kind of dating on the app too. So it is, it is interesting that we're kind of start serving these two, two different markets. So um, a big topic in the news lately has been data privacy. So I was wondering how the league has dealt with that issue and just like in general, how dating apps deal with that. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's um, it's tough because there's different data privacy acts depending on what what country you're in. So UK has super strict ones um, that we have to abide by. I think you know we have we've been lucky because we're we're small, so we don't have. Um, I guess we we haven't had we haven't had like people having to to really need to know kind of exactly what databases we're using and and all that stuff. And we've been we've been pretty I've been pretty like let's. Let's let Apple handle it. Let's let Facebook handle it. Let's let um, Google handle it. So we don't take passwords. We don't take, um, you know, we, we kind of try to try to let the third party vendors that are really good at that, that do that. So we almost 
we almost try not to <laughs> store any personally identifiable data. And we, we have a lot of data, like your Facebook data and your LinkedIn data, but it's pretty innocuous. You know, it's not, it's not, it's nothing that like if, if hacked, people could associate it to, to the user. So that's sort of how we kind of think about data is we try to keep our, <laughs> keep it out of our systems until we kind of know that we have that enterprise grade security in place. So you mentioned before that you were a solo founder. Yeah, um, did I you like ever... to say single founder, founder. and then <laughs> unintended. <laughs> yeah. um, did you That's because ever... I'm cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever consider having a co-founder or? Um... Yeah, it's like um, it's kind of like dating. Like, yeah, you want a boyfriend, but they just they're, they're not there. You know, like the. <laughs> Like you haven't found one that you want to make your boyfriend, so you don't, you just don't have one. Um, so that was sort of like I tried, like I went on. There was actually a co-founder dating site for a while. I think it might have gone down, but um, I went on a couple awkward like co-founder dates there. I, um, you know, went to some meetups. I don't know. I think it's it's tough because you're you're so you're literally a walking cartoon character of an MBA with a PowerPoint, because you are. <laughs> and so you're just like laughing at yourself while you're up there, you know, being like, I'm looking for a technical co-founder. I was just like, couldn't. I almost was just like, I can't, I can't be that person that we all make fun of, like that all the engineers make fun of. So I was like, I'm just going to pay someone. Um, and that's part of, you know, life is you can pay people to do jobs and you can manage it and it you can be a really good project if you manage it well, right? So I think instead of trying to kind of look for the unicorn technical co-founder that, you know, complimented my style and we worked together well and we were never, you know, never going to divorce or whatever, I just said, let's just go find sort of like Mr. Right Now. <laughs> and so that sort of that built my companies on uh, Mr. Right Now, as I would say, in the sense that we use a lot of contractors, we use a lot of people that like we needed their skills at the at that point in time but then you know six 12 months later you, do, you don't and it, it you know in some ways I kind of like to say it's like you don't want to enter a relationship if you don't know kind of if you need that person for the long term right and so I think you know now we have a director of engineering that will definitely be with us for the long term but I'm glad I I'm glad I like didn't settle <laughs> I guess I'm glad I waited um, for kind of the right person, the right fit. And, you know, we needed to be a little bit bigger before we could attract the kind of person that I, I want to work with. So I had to kind of, like, be sort of realistic with myself. Like, I wasn't going to be able to attract. It is like dating. <laughs> it's, it's like dating. I was like, I need to hit the gym a little bit, you know, and, like, get the company kind of up and running so that I can attract a really, you know, high-caliber engineer to join me. So that was sort of how I thought about it. So the league has got a lot of media criticism initially for being kind of elitist. Um, so were you prepared for that at the time when you launched it to, for the extent of the media criticism that it got? Um, I, I, I was prepared that it would be a polarizing message uh, to some people. And I knew, I mean, I, and I, and I kind of knew that like the people we wanted in our community would get it. And the people that would probably never want to be in a community like that would probably criticize it. So I kind of... I kind of knew, I kind of knew that we would get some some criticism, but I think I was surprised at just sort of. Oh, by the way, I don't have a computer science degree. Uh, it's information systems, and that that was like part of the sort of the trolling you get, I guess, or the trolling I got on after kind of after some of the the media backlash, where I think one of them was I wrote I wrote a retort being like I'm not an elitist, I'm an alpha female, and then the gawker the gawker writer wrote. I'm not a elitist, I'm an asshole or something and like made and then made fun of me for being like she thinks she has a computer science degree and she doesn't and I was like correction I didn't say I said I entered with it. Anyway, so we had a little bit of a squabble on online, but um long long story short, I think that um yeah, I, I think I was surprised that people didn't uh, didn't understand how riddled the dating um industry is with just like atrocious low quality uh, spam accounts that you know have in, in, engaged in kind of like nefarious behavior i mean it's like a really big thing in online dating there's all sorts of frauds there's all sorts of people that like pretend to get in relationships and then steal money from people like like it is a it is a, sh a shit show out there for lack of a better word and i guess i was I was taken aback by just a lack of knowledge, I guess, the media had about that because they just assumed we were being so elitist. And I'm like, no, this is how you build a really high quality community because you, you, you start super selective and you can kind of always expand out, but you can never really go backwards, right? So it's, it, it just seemed like common sense, I guess, to me. Uh, you know, that's how Facebook rolled out. Like, and so I guess I was just surprised that they didn't kind of understand that is like a very critical part to building an online 
community that's very healthy and high quality and engaged. Um, and then I also just didn't understand why, you know, something where when you're dating, the number of, like two places you meet in dating are work and school. So I guess I just didn't understand why people couldn't make that jump in their head, which is like, what? Well, of course, why would, you know, our community, of course, is going to be around these two epicenters that create really, you know, successful couples that we're trying to, you know, make it so that you don't have to be at the exact same university, right? We're just trying to, to kind of take that, that recipe and, and apply it. So, so yeah, I guess, I guess that was, I, I sort of lost faith in the, in the media a little bit. But, uh, and I realized that, that they really don't fact check much. So fake news is a thing. <laughs> um, so last question before we open it to audience questions. Um, so for people that are thinking of joining a startup or maybe even starting their own startup, um, could you give some career advice and like how you evaluated that decision and how people should go about that? Yeah, I like to think, well, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of different paths, so I, I don't think there's one right, right way to do it. I like to, I like to talk about my path as one option um, because I think it worked for what I'm doing. Um, and, and I think that path was to just get exposure in the industries you're interested in and, and work for the best in class companies and try to work for the best in class people at those companies if you can. So I think, um, you know, I think I started my career at salesforce.com. Uh, I think Mark Benioff is like a best in class CEO. So I feel like I bring a lot of, you know, to my company as baby company, we're only 22 people now, right? But I, I bring a lot of like Mark Benioff style because he's very, you know, sales and marketing driven and very, um, you know, I just thought, I like excellent leader. And then, you know, Google was an amazing place to learn kind of product development and learn how, how engineers are treated and how, you know, how you build an innovative company and a culture. And so I pull a lot of their stuff, especially around internal culture. And, um, and so I think having, not having had those experiences and just kind of working at, um, you know, maybe places that haven't really built, built these kind of best in, class infrastructures, I, I think you, you don't gain, you don't kind of see how something could work at, you know, a super high level. So I, I like to think that getting exposure, and even though some of the jobs I did were very, very not, not sexy, I mean, my first job out of college, I was literally like an assistant for someone that was customer facing. So I like wasn't allowed to talk to <laughs> customers, but I had to do all the work, and then the, the person went and presented my work as if it were their own um, for like a year and a half. And you're, I'm literally like doing data loading and you know, writing SQL. And so it's, yeah, so I mean, you're not doing glamorous stuff, but you're doing the actual work that is required to move the company forward. And I think getting experience doing that, the actual kind of work, I like to say, that moves the company forward. Like I, I carried a sales quota at Salesforce and I think that was super helpful because it, it you know, you learn how to pitch everything in, startup land is pitching, you're pitching investors, you're pitching people to download your app, you're pitching people to pay for something, you're pitching people to kind of believe in you and refer, your, refer their friends to your community. So you, you constantly are, are kind of asking people to do things, right? And so I think learning how to do that really well um, and, and learning how to do that on a kind of repeatable basis as, you know, with a quota is, is was a super helpful skill for me too. Um, so I, I, I think learning kind of the, the trade and kind of coming in being a, and like brushing off your ego a little bit and going in at the low level because I remember being like so disgruntled and I was like, I can't believe I'm, I should be getting to like, you know, go and talk to them in, in person and my friend is over here is getting to like talk to Dell in person and I'm stuck in the back room and so I remember being like so disgruntled but now I look back on it and I'm like, I was just like an entitled millennial being annoying. Um, so I'm like, I wish I, I kind of realized that and just sort of said like, this is all kind of towards the, the greater good, which is, you know, your eventual career path. These are skills that, that you now have, right? So. Great. Um, so we're gonna open it up to audience questions now, so. This is my favorite part. Um, I think they said you can push the microphone if you, we, do, we don't wanna have to pass the mic around. Yeah, see how it goes. Thank you. Hi, Hi. I'm Ray Hunko. I'm at the Berkman Klein Center, and I'm a quantitative social scientist. I am curious as to whether you're doing any predictive modeling and what kinds of data you're using for that. Yeah, we are. We just, um, but, but new. So we're, we're little. We're three years old. So we just got, I guess six months ago, we just got our head of analytics, and he's hired a data team, and now we're, we're really starting to to really start to, to build out the predictive models. And what you use predictive models for, we use it for a couple of different things. One is we're trying to predict high quality applicants. 
um, without human review, right? And then we match it to what the humans say. And, you know, it's like, it's like if Harvard could automate their admissions. So we're kind of trying to, trying to predict that. We're trying to predict, um, obviously, revenue optimization. So trying to predict who, who we think has a high likelihood of, of pain is being a pain member and those people we want to, like, kind of treat differently, right? You want to nurture them and um, make sure that they have a really good experience in the app if they're a paid member versus a, a free member you want to you know that that's kind of a you kind of want to put them through a different funnel right because now you're sort of trying to sell them on the upgrade versus the people who've already upgraded you kind of want to now predict are they going to buy something else right so i would say for the most part um we're also now looking to do it for churn so if we predict that you're about to maybe you got into a relationship we can then start to say you're probably not a good person to be matching with me because i'm going to me- message you and you're going to flake on me because you're you're starting to have like, you know, disengage, signs of disengagement. So we're starting to, because my, my theory on that is one of the reasons why flakiness or, you know, people messaging and not writing back is such, is so prevalent is that you're actually kind of on different timing spectrums, right? So if you're, I'm on date three with a guy, maybe I match with someone, someone says hi, but I kind of like to say it's like in job hunting, like you finished all the phone screens, you're, you know, you're on the on sites and someone says, will you phone screen me? You're not going to give them as much, you know, you kind of, they, they kind of miss the boat, right? So it's, I tend to, my theory, and I haven't proven this with a ton of data yet, but we're working on it, is that if we can kind of predict where you are in sort of the like, let's call it the, you know, search, search, lifetime partner search process, then we can kind of better, better match people together that are in the, that same time zone. So, or time zone, I guess time, time window is a better word. But yeah, good question. And if you want to help us, we love, <laughs> we love smart people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do you want me to call or you? How, who's oh. in charge here? <laughs> so I think one of the biggest problems dating apps face is the weaker, uh, relatively weaker user loyalty they cultivate in comparison to other social networking platforms. And I think one of the major causes of that is that users are not required or compelled to invest a lot of their own time and effort into curating their profile, let's say in real, uh, in comparison to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. How do you plan, or how do you, or how do you plan to address this problem? So just to rephrase, you're, you're saying people spend a lot more time on their Instagram, their Snapchat, their Facebook, and they care less about their dating profile? Well, it's more that they are more likely to abandon ship and switch over to a different dating app. Got it. You're saying they're, they're download whatever new thing is on the market, and yeah. Well, so I, think, I actually think that's okay, because... I think that one of the things about our industry that's that's like good for a newcomer is that there is a low barrier to entry and people are open to switching because if you think about it, everyone's, you know, the super rational people realize that you want as many kind of leads, right? If you're really looking and you, like it's a function of, it's, it's a numbers game, right? And that's, let's say you're, you're super determined to find someone in the next three months. You want to download every app, you know, get all the matches and sort of put them through a, a process in like, you know, in theory, right? And not that people do that in theory, but, but so I kind of think of it as, as, as it's an okay thing. And I think, I think that the issue is they have to go, the newcomers have to go get all the users, right? Or else it's not beneficial for you to, to download the app. So I think after you download five apps and there's less people on it and they're like, you know, less high, lower quality than Bumble and Tinder and the league and you kind of keep, keep having that, you're going to stop downloading the apps every time a new one comes out, right? Because you're going to kind of realize that the, the product doesn't work without a really sizable user base. And so, I mean, I think ours is even small like for dating in the sense that you know, it took us a really long time to even get our small group of users. So I just, it's so hard to build up a, a user base unless you have a 10 million bucks to kind of throw at Facebook ads. So I guess, I guess long story short is that I, I, I don't get too concerned about people like down, like my friends are always like, oh, I joined a new one, you know, and they're, they're, they theoretically should be the most loyal um, league user, right? And I'm like, tell me if, you know, if there's anyone on there that, that we should, you know, get them on the league. And it's never usually a, it's always a subset, right? It's always a subset. So then at that point, it doesn't add that much value, right? The best product wins. If, if everybody's the same on all the apps, then the, the best software wins. So I think that's sort of how I like to think of it, is like we want to just be the best product and the best kind of user experience. Yeah. 
Hi. I was wondering um, if you also use the league and how would that work? <laughs> I do. My last, um, actually, my last two relationships, the one I'm, guy I'm dating now and my prior boyfriend were both sourced via the league. One was through an event, though, so it was an offline, offline sourced <laughs> acquisition, I guess you could call it offline acquisition. Um, <laughs> And then, the yeah, the second guy I met on the league. But I will say, like, I'll be honest, I mean, he was also on Coffee Meets Bagel. He was on Bumble. So, I mean, I think that um, I'm on those just to, to check them out. So, I, I guess I, I mean, you got to keep, you got to follow your competitors closely, man. Keep your competitors close. But, but so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting because we've noticed even when users match or you know, see the same people on these other apps, we've seen that we actually have a higher conversion rate to kind of offline date. So it's almost like people treat each other slightly differently on the league when they meet on the league, even if it's the same person. So I kind of equate it to being a, like at a friend's dinner party, you kind of have a higher chance of going on a date with someone you met there than at this, you know, all you can drink bar. So I like to think that, that the league is the dinner party, <laughs> if you didn't catch that. <laughs> yeah. Stripes. <laughs> what, what data do you have and, and look at things that are valuable that maybe your users wouldn't realize you have or that they don't know you <laughs> Are you going to sue me after this? Uh, <laughs> we are at Harvard Law School. Um, we try not to collect data that our users don't know about. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll double check that and get back to you. But um, no, I think one feature we're, we're going to be launching, which I'm super excited about, which is uh, you know, asking users for their location data, which we haven't yet to this day, because I always felt like it was creepy. And I never really wanted, when I was designing the league, I wanted it to be about dating and sort of like, you know, kind of like scheduling a couple days in advance. I didn't want like a, hey, where are you right now? Let's meet up, because I felt like that you know, insinuated a kind of one night stand type of a situation. So we never really collected location data um, until now because we're now going to be piloting what I think is exciting, but it will, the users will have to kind of opt into it as if they share their location data, then they can see where the other single people that fit their preferences are going to be on, on the map. So they can kind of see, like, if you are going out on a Friday night, like, what are the best areas to go if you're 40 and single? And, you know, these are the kind of people you like. So it's call it, I call it my party scout. We, we're calling it party scout. But um, it's not, and it's not, it's anonymous. You wouldn't see who it is. And it's only, like, clusters of people. So it was, you know, hopefully it's not going to freak people out. It might freak people out. So we're, we're, we're kind of beta, we're going to be beta testing it in a couple weeks. But the idea would be to, to see kind of where the critical mass is, not necessarily where like Amanda actually is, you know, not a privacy. But that is a potential area where we could get, you know, some people freaking out about privacy. So if you see that in the news in a couple weeks, that's what's happening. No, I'm yeah. I was um, talking with my friend the other day, and we were discussing how sometimes like on Bumble, you'll swipe a million, million times, and it's like, I wish the app could predict who I was going to like. And I'm an entrepreneur as well and feel like anytime I think of something, the industry is probably already doing it. <laughs> um, so I guess I know you've talked a little bit about predictive analytics. Yeah. Um, and I know that you guys understand like, you know, like that you'll give out a message like more than 50% of our users like swipe right on your right. profile or something like that. So I'm wondering if you're going to, I know you kind of circled around this, but I'm wondering what kind of predictive analytics are you going to be able to kind of, kind of like AI, be like the friend, like I know my friends who did, yeah, she'll swipe like left on totally. this, she'll, she'll swipe right on this. I'm sure software can do the exact same thing, and I'm wondering, I'm sure you guys are working on it, and I'm wondering what the timeline is you think on the industry actually being. You're like, I'm sick of swiping my thumb yeah. hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will save your thumbs. No, I think it's a no. It's a good. It's a good point, and you're right. Like, there's no reason we should be giving you people you're swiping left on if we have, especially if we have like 10 years of data on you, right? Um, I think. I think there's a couple of things, though. I think there's one is that preferences can change over time, right? So if you know, if depending on obviously how much you know, how long we have, kind of have you on the app. Um, I think the other thing we've seen is that. It's like I think a Hinge or somebody put a report about about this, but that it's like not a very democratic 
swiping hierarchy in the sense that you know you have a ton a lot of the women are like swiping for seven percent of the men right they all kind of like these seven percent and then there's you know the rest <laughs> the rest that are kind of not getting very many matches right and same with the women i think there's like 20 percent that get you know a ton of a ton of attention and then you know the 80 percent that don't so it's it's uh like yes i could give you all the guys that <laughs> you know that you know 80 percent of women let i guess there's something to be said for um the difference between, I guess, knowing your own personal preferences and then can we help you kind of go outside of your preferences so that you swipe right on someone that you might not have, right? That's kind of what we're thinking about is like that guy that you screened out because he was 5'10 and not 5'11, but we actually think he would have been a good match that would talk to you. You know, he's going to message first and all this other stuff. He's going to be a good match. Like how, how do we give you that guy? Because no one's, not enough people are swiping on him, but he's actually a really good match, but he's getting filtered out, right? So it's like, how, how do we kind of help our users that might be kind of in getting filtered out because everyone's looking for the same sort of set of criteria. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually a really tough matching, <laughs> matching problem. So we're starting to get some more, some more like PhDs and people involved because I think that, um, yeah, I think my, my vision is to have everyone have their own algorithm so we know exactly who you're gonna, and then every day when you, when you get your batch, those are basically people that have almost, we've already kind of guaranteed you guys are gonna both be interested in each other, right? That's, a, that's the vision. <laughs> It is. So yeah, check back, check back in 2018. <laughs> Hold me accountable, right? Yeah, back there. Um, so a few of my friends, I was on the okay. um, it's black. Um, but a few of my friends and I, uh, mostly black women, have been talking about how maybe it's kind of hard, um, or it seems a little, like I wonder if the self-selection, uh, people that want to join the league, kind of select out for diversity. And so how do you address that, right, issues? I remember going on the league most of the guys. Right. So we've worked on, we've worked on um, trying to like get the marketing to, we call it like gap filling, right? So it's like if we were running out of, you know, men 45 to 50 or we're running out of this type of demographic where we're trying to focus on getting a process that, like when you are looking for someone and we don't have anyone that fits your preferences, like essentially that almost like rings a, a buzzer to kind of our marketing department that then goes and kind of acquires, you know, a user that hopefully fits those preferences. So that's, that's where we're kind of trying to go so that, so that we're kind of sourcing people based on the demand of the community and not just kind of burning marketing dollars, you know, trying to get people in that aren't sort of in demand, right? So I think, I guess, I guess my, my point to that is that like every swipe, every time we don't give you someone that doesn't fit your preferences, that kind of like we collect that data and we're like kind of funneling marketing spend there. So that's sort of how we, how we think about um, acquisition from a, so, so I don't know if that's a good answer, but I, I guess, yeah, we're spending marketing dollars on that same, that very initiative. Yeah. I have an app marketing agency here in Boston. We don't have an app store from kind of where they are to where they want to be. Uh, my question for an acquisition rate for other than referrals, what would you say is kind of the biggest trigger to your growth and analysis? So we don't do a lot of paid acquisition just because, um, well, a couple of reasons. One, it's expensive. <laughs> it's super expensive. Uh, it can be between like $10 and $30 to like acquire one of you guys on, on Facebook. And if we put Harvard, it would probably like triple. So, um, so it's, it's like a very costly way. And, and we've noticed that the drop-off rate's way higher. So if we acquire you through Facebook versus if she tells you to download, um, you're going to get through our kind of funnel much higher probability when, when your friend tells you to download or sends you a text than Facebook. So we've, we've really tried to lean more into referrals um, just because I think you get higher quality users. It's a lot harder, and you're kind of asking your community to do your sales for you. But, but I think... It, in a way, that's sort of like the right way, I think, to build the community. So we've, yeah, we, we've been trying to, like, my goal is to never have to do a paid acquisition because I think it's just a crappy business model you can get stuck into. <laughs> but most people in our industry do, and we will have to be doing that. Like, that's, that's definitely on the, on the horizon, but we've tried to, like, get this far without it. <laughs> Right. Oh, just organic, like word of mouth, yeah. Yeah. I think we're out of time for questions, or maybe just one more. 
Has to be good. Who's doing it? We don't, so we don't collect. Um, I mean, we have people when they get married, they'll write in and tell us, but we don't, we don't like track. It's too expensive. We, we don't spend the time to track down marriages, unfortunately. I know that's that's on our to do list once we have a couple more people, because <laughs> it is going to be a really good data. Yeah. Right. No, I, I think we'll just have, you just need to have a big enough sample, right? So we would need to have, I don't know, a couple hundred marriages to, to model off of. So that's something we haven't collected yet. But I think we're probably nearing that number, so hopefully. All right. Um, I think that's all the time we have. So thank Cool. You. Well, thank you guys. Great questions.